Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me down here. Uh, as, as Jimmy said, uh, in fact, I guess about nine-tenths of my group is working on spins in silicon. And Micah has been working on uh, electrons on helium. Forrest was the, the student who preceded Micah. And I'll talk about some of the data from, from those two. So, um, so yeah, so what we've been doing is wanting to make spin qubits, electron spin qubits. And one of the good materials to do that in is silicon. Uh, I see Bruce came in. Bruce is, is the cause of all of that. Uh, but uh, we were trying to think, is there a way we could make a spin that might have long coherence and also be mobile? And so uh, we've been playing around with electrons on helium. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about the system. Uh, in fact, we, well, I'll, I'll mention there's some limits we can put on, on spin relaxation. Uh, we don't have uh, final numbers on all that yet. And then we can make devices. So you go to most people and you say, well, I'm going to float electrons on helium. And they say, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cool physics. What I want to convince you is, that you can actually make devices. And the kinds of things that people, well, I come from a semiconductor physics background. You know, it's sort of transistors and these kinds of things. Well, we think we can do that with electrons on helium. So I'm going to talk about some CCDs and some turnstiles. And that will pretty much be the end of it. So um, some of you may remember that there was a, a well-known statement about it's the economy, stupid. Um, I had to give a talk about materials issues for donors and phosphorus. And uh, it turns out materials, as in anything, when you're going to try and make a big system, it comes down to materials. You have to get all the materials working just right. And so uh, part of what I'm going to talk about uh, is that we're going to try and get rid or work our way around some of the materials issues. And the way we're going to do that is float electrons on helium. So if you go back 40 years, give or take, uh, people, there was a whole crowd of people looking at two-dimensional electrons in silicon, silicon dioxide systems. And there were a group of people doing electrons on the surface of helium. And they were sort of equal numbers. If you were, uh, went to the 2D electron conference in the, in the mid-70s, yeah, it was sort of half and half. Um, and what people had found actually in the late 60s is that electrons stick to the surface of superfluid helium. They see an image charge in the helium. Plus, you can, you can put on a voltage and you can bind them pretty much as tightly as you want. Uh, in the z direction, you just have a radial hydrogenic waveform. In xy direction, uh, they're just plane waves. These are free to move around. And in fact, they are incredibly free. So there's a guy down the hall from me, a guy, Lauren Pfeiffer, and he has the world record highest mobility 2D electrons in gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide heterostructures. He now, I think, is up to 36 million mobility. Uh, Sort of without even trying, you get 100 million mobility with electrons on helium. Um, and uh, they also works at very low density. And in fact, as I said, in the 70s, there were lots of people working on it. What happened? Well, you can never, at least in a bulk system, you can't get more than about 10 to the 9 per square centimeter because there's a hydrodynamic instability where the helium surface gives way, and the electrons just all go down to the lower plate. And in particular, what that means is you never get them Fermi degenerate. And so then things like the quantum Hall effect and the fractional quantum Hall effect came along. And all that requires on having you having a metallic Fermi degenerate layer. And so this system sort of fell out of favor for just doing 2D electrons. But if you go back and you say, if you want to make qubits, well, you want something maybe that 
works at very low densities because you want to keep them far apart. Uh, and in fact, there are multiple ways you can build a qubit. Uh, so the original proposal, Phil Platzman and Mark Dickman, they were arguing, hey, if I look at the motion in the z direction, I have a ground state that's just hydrogenic. It's sort of a 1D version. A first excited state, uh, people had measured those. Uh, the bare frequency is about 120 gigahertz. And said, let's use those two states. It's just like an atomic system. I'll use those two states as my uh, two levels of my qubit. They are really, there are, these things are a charge qubit. You're moving charges. So it's the usual trade off. You get very strong interactions, but coherence isn't so good. OK, so. Our group had been working on spins, and so then we argued, hey, let's not worry about the uh, excitations out of the plane. Let's just use the electron spin as a qubit. And then Dave Schuster, and Dave's background is doing superconducting qubits and resonators. He said, hey, let's make a little puddle and put an electron in there, and we're going to lateral motion. We're going to get an anharmonic oscillator. And this looks like an anharmonic system that usually we make some little superconducting widget. Uh, let's try and, and use an electron on helium for that. And uh, Dave's at Chicago now, and he's working on that. I'll talk today about the spin part. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, we're going to end up wanting thin films of helium. And there are people who have worked very hard, and you can do it. If you level everything just right, you can make a micron thick film of helium across a fairly large surface. Uh, but that's really the hard way to do it. Uh, the easy way to do it is you have something that holds your, your substrate, and you just etch some little channels into, your, into whatever surface you're going to be working with. The helium sits down here. Capillary action just means that the helium is going to go up and fill those channels, and especially when it's a superfluid, it does that very well. Uh, and now you have these channels, and what we're going to do is we're going to make the top one, and we'll call that like a ground plane or something. We'll have an insulator. We'll have a gate back here. And so if we make this guy positive, we can just hold electrons uh, in that channel. The depth of the helium is now very well defined by whatever whatever layers you put down, so you know how deep it is. You don't have to worry about leveling. This thing can be, it doesn't really matter. We usually have it maybe a centimeter below the surface, uh, that top surface. And uh, so you can precisely define the depth of your helium. You know, you do some standard lithography, and you define the shape of that. And so you can make uh, structures that way that will uh, control the helium for you. So the first thing I'll do is say what we know about electron spin coherence, which unfortunately isn't enough. Uh, and let me first by talking about something I do know something about, uh, and that is spins in silicon. And we can take a phosphorus donor, and that spin, that electron is now tightly bound to that phosphorus donor. So tightly means 50 milli electron volts. You do this at, at 4 Kelvin, say, uh, right? You're many, many orders of magnitude down from the, from the binding energy. So this guy is tightly bound. And because of that, you can get long coherence. So we've shown that you can get at least 10 seconds. I don't think that's the limit. Um, it's, it really then comes down to uh, if it's phosphorus, doped silicon, how well can you get rid of isotopes that you don't want, which means silicon 29. On the other hand, if that electron is free to move around the surface, now the problem is it's a spin orbit interaction inside that silicon. It's shut off here because you bound this thing tightly and you can't distort that wave function without putting in a pretty big force. But up here, the electron's free to move around, and you get spin coherence times of the order of microseconds. I think we've gotten up to maybe 10 microseconds in, in some of the best samples uh, in a 2D electron layer. So what happens with electrons on helium? This 
so-called Rashba effect that decoheres the free electrons there. What's it going to do here? Uh, and for that, we have to know something about the spin-orbit interaction, and not much is known. So we have this electron up here. It's sitting, oh, 75 angstroms or so above the surface when it's in the ground state. If we have no electric field pulling it, if we have an electric field, it'll get down a little closer. So the electron does not want to go into the helium because these are all filled shell. Pauli exclusion principle says that electron can't overlap with the electrons down here. And so that's what gives us the, the barrier to going into the helium. The question is, though, if you're going to get a spin orbit interaction, that means that to get that, you need that electron to spend part of its time in the helium 2p band. That's the first place you can get a spin orbit interaction. And so the question is, can we get an estimate for that? And in part, we can. So if you take that electron and you push it really hard, or more easily, if you generate the electron inside the helium, uh, you form electron bubbles. So these have all been studied. They're about 15 angstroms across. Uh, and now a group back, what, 30 years ago, did some experiments measuring just CW electron spin resonance from electron bubbles. The advantage of the bubbles are that you can have a lot of them. If you only have a layer on the surface, it's hard to get enough spins to get a signal. So that's what we're working on now. Here it's a volume effect, so you can get a lot more. Um, but at any rate, what they could do is they could figure out how different is the G factor of this electron from the free electron G. And what they could say is the difference from the free electron G was no more than three parts in 10 to the 7. So to compare silicon, it's different from the free electron G by about a part in 10 to the 3rd. And so that's just telling you how big your spin orbit interaction is. And if you put that in, you find out that the decoherence you'll get from this uh, spin orbit interaction, it goes as that factor squared. So it should be seven orders of magnitude less decoherence in silicon, which says that mobile electrons should have a spin coherence of about 10 seconds from this process. So what we think is that these electrons then are going to not only have long coherence, but they're going to be mobile qubits with long coherence. In that sense, they're sort of like an ion trap, where you can move your ions around. They maintain coherence. Here we think we can do the same thing with these electrons. Ah, uh, no, because that the line width is going to be determined by your uh, by the magnetic field in homogeneity, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, what they were doing is saying, how far is this line shifting? Line widths. Uh, so silicon. Uh, the best piece of silicon we have gotten is a bulk piece of this Avogadro silicon. So this was this project to make the new standard kilogram out of a sphere of isotopically enriched, chemically purified silicon where you could measure its size interferometrically. You know exactly how many atoms there are. You know how much each atom weighs. And now you have a new standard kilogram. Um, the good news is that when they make those spheres, which I guess are sort of this big, uh, you pull a crystal and you have to cut the corners off. And we got pieces of the corners. Uh, and so here is a piece. It's fairly lightly, pretty lightly phosphorus doped silicon. And the longest T2 star we can get. So this is a spin echo experiment. We did a pi over 2 pulse here, free induction decay, a pi pulse. Here's your spin echo. Uh, this, in fact, is taken in a single microwave shot. So we have enough spins that we can do a single shot echo. It turns out to be important for some of the experiments. But T2 star is about 8 microseconds. So that tells you your line width. If you go back, and now we have uh, a 28 silicon epitaxial layer on top of uh, natural silicon, they have a very slightly different lattice constant. We had 
antimony implanted, about 150 nanometers. Now you're down to a T2 star of about a microsecond. So to see how that compares with things, uh, if you just say, okay, I have Lorentzian lines, in fact, some of them probably aren't, that implanted silicon was up here. It has like a 300 kilohertz line width. Uh, Avogadro silicon, it had like a 30 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz line width. The electrons on helium question Ian asked, uh, that had about a 3 kilohertz line width. Uh, these two, this one may be partially limited by our magnet homogeneity. That one definitely is not. Uh, this one, the guys who, who did those experiments worked very, very hard to get a, a very homogeneous field. For comparison, there's some recent data that came out a year or so ago. Uh, the group in, in Australia has looked at single donors and what is their line width. And they actually looked at two donors. One uh, was somewhat broader than this ensemble line width, and one was somewhat narrower, but on the same sort of scale, sort of kilohertz line width. These, I should say, they're, they're a single donor, but you have to do multiple measurements. So there's a time ensemble rather than a spatial ensemble. This is an ensemble of probably, they probably had 10 to the 13 electron bubbles in there. Uh, and what it tells you is all those really have pretty much exactly the same frequency. In that sense, they're like ions and atoms. Uh, electrons in silicon, whether bound to donors or not, tend not to be as, uh, you know, they're strains, they're stray electric fields that can shift the, the frequency. So how do you, what we'd like to do is we'd like to measure these spin coherence. Uh, I'll tell you right now, we haven't managed to finish that experiment. Uh, the problem is you don't have much signal. And the other problem is we can't get these electron spins to relax. So uh, in this experiment, we need a lot of spins. And the way you do that, which has always seemed crazy to me, you have this superfluid helium. And about a millimeter away, you put a filament. And you eat it up to a couple thousand degrees and boil off some electrons, which has always seemed like just the craziest thing, but it just works. I mean, <laughs> this has been done in this field for, for 40 years, and that's how you put electrons down on the surface. Um, you don't leave the filament on for a long time, a few milliseconds, you pulse it. Uh, at any rate, uh, the problem is we can't get the spins to relax. So we want a T1 time, and they aren't thermalizing, and they're coming off at 2,000 degrees, and we need a difference, population difference between spin up and spin down to see it. Uh, so what we want to do is find a way to relax them rapidly. And the theory is that if we take a metal and have a thin helium film such that electron is close to the metal, then the Johnson noise currents in the metal will relax the spins in times like a second for reasonable distances if this is a couple hundred angstroms. Uh, the problem is, if you're only a couple hundred angstroms away, if you have, you know, like a one angstrom bump, the image charge that this guy sees and this guy sees are a little different position, and I think the number is that traps an electron with a few Kelvin. Um, so you need ultra smooth materials, and uh, there's a long story, but this is what we came up with. Uh, to get an ultra smooth material, what you need to do is get an undergraduate over the summer to look at all kinds of materials under the AFM and find the absolutely most boring picture they can find, right? No structure on it all, just, just the most boring picture you can, you can come up with. So what we found is that if we oxidized a piece of silicon and sputtered a very thin layer of iridium, uh, and the iridium is only because the SEM lab use, has an iridium sputterer because it will conformally coat things even when you only put on a couple nanometers. And you can't get too rough a film if it's continuous and only a couple nanometers thick. So that was the most boring picture we could get. Uh, and so in fact, what we did was this is silicon dioxide. And there's a, a process, if people are old enough and remember the thing called locos, was a way of making uh, integrated circuits in the, in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Uh, and what you do is we wanted to make a channel. And so what we have is our iridium out there. We have aluminum down here. 
And what Micah has shown is that she can take electrons. We fill this up with helium now. There's a very thin layer of helium out there, a couple hundred, maybe a hundred angstroms thick. Here we have a nice deep channel so we can measure transport and measure numbers of electrons. And she's shown that we can take electrons, move them from the helium onto this region out here, and move them back. So that's the, the plan to do the spin resonance experiment is thermalize them over here, then bring them over here and, and measure spin. What's the vertical spin? Uh, so the whole picture is 10 microns. So this is about a three-quarter micron deep channel here. So this one's two okay, microns. So it's the same scale vertically. Yeah, the same scale vertically. Yeah, it's just an SEM picture. Cleaved it. Yeah, it also, one of the critical issues is that that, you need a nice, round, smooth transition from the metal to this trough over here. If you have a sharp edge and just end, the dipole uh, energy is about 25 millivolts, which is, yeah, hundreds of Kelvin. And so you have a very hard time pulling the electrons off the metal. So why we picked this particular way, because it has this nice sort of rounded, profile and you spread out that dipole force over a large distance and you can pull the electrons off. So mobile qubits, does anyone care? And I'll argue yes. Uh, are they necessary? The answer is no. So you can, in the, in the quantum information community, people like to do surface codes. These things have high, high error rate threshold and you only need nearest neighbor gates. So it's not absolutely necessary to have mobile qubits. They're certainly convenient. I mean, if, usually when you start thinking about algorithms, it's nice to think, well, I take this qubit over here and this one over here and you bring them together. Uh, that only works if they're mobile and stay coherent. Uh, they do have a quantifiable advantage. So if you go back to the surface code and if you have qubits that you can move some small distance across your chip, you can speed up or your overhead can be reduced by factors of order 100 or 1,000 because instead of having to do it, all your operations by braiding, you can just go move them over, do an operation, and pull them apart. So there are real advantages to having uh, mobile coherent qubits. So now I'm going to start telling you about sort of engineering things. And so, all right, as I said, I come out of the semiconductor world. So the first thing you do is you look at a chip. So this is a process. Our first chips were made by some friends at Sandia. And this is just their standard picture on the website. And uh, as a semiconductor person, you spend all your time worrying about the transistors down here. We don't have any transistors in our chip. All we are doing is using the metal. We just want to use these things and let some lab that is very good at making metals and gaps and so forth, uh, build that for us. So now we take that and we put that into our cells. So here is a copper cell. Here's our chip. And what we did was we etched off the top layer of insulator. We etched down here. This makes our channels. And all the rest of the chip is just to get voltages in and out and so that we can uh, bond in from the outside. Again, yeah, we don't have any transistors in it. We have a little depression over here. You take the drill, you make a little bit deeper. You get some bulk helium down there. Helium goes around and covers everything. Uh, we like to put electrons down when we don't need very many of them. What we do is bring a UV fiber down. We have a piece of sapphire with a zinc film, and we photoemit electrons. It doesn't put a lot of heat into the system. And uh, yeah, we can, with every pulse from our little light source, you get a few thousand electrons. So that's sort of convenient. The, the filaments give you millions of electrons and you have trouble with too many. So uh, here is an actual picture of the chip that, and well, we had built several things, but there's a region in here that we're going to use. We have something we call a wide reservoir and a narrow reservoir. That means we have channels here. This is after we've etched it. This is that top plane. Down below, this is the channel. We had wide channels here, narrow channels there. We weren't sure before we started 
whether we were going to be able to collect any electrons over here, and that's why we had the wide ones. But in fact, it worked just fine, and so we used electrons over there. To give you an idea of the scale, what we have, uh, these channels are three microns wide, about two microns deep. Uh, the pitch of these gates down here is three microns. Uh, so on a scale of things, fairly large for a, for a semiconductor uh, world. Uh, the way we are going to measure them are we're going to collect electrons over here. We're going to have our door that's going to let electrons into this region here. Uh, we have then a gate that we're going to use as a sense gate. Now, this one has 120 parallel channels, and we run them yeah, all in parallel. So that sense gate will be measuring electrons in all the channels. Uh, what we do is we have a gate that Forrest named the twiddle gate that we twiddle. So we twiddle the voltage there. That pushes the electron back and forth. And we can sense when that electron goes over this sense gate. And now what we're going to do is play around with electrons in this system. So I'm just going to show some data where we moved electrons back and forth. We made some little memory cells where we can store electrons. And yeah, they work. Uh, we made some vertical channels that goes up uh, all the way up that. And yes, that works too. Um, chip, uh, well, here is a picture of the cell. And yeah, there are a lot of connections to this thing. That's mounted up on a board. And so now um, we're going to do a three-phase CCD. So uh, the way this thing works is we have uh, three different phases. So in the end, only three gates coming out. And we can make one positive. It holds the electron. We make the next one positive. Make that one a little negative. The electron moves over one, one gate. Do it again. Moves again and so forth. And now we've moved one pixel. So that's a pixel uh, in, the, in the usual CCD parlance. So uh, now we go back. And if you talk to George Smith, he was one of the guys who invented the CCD. He said inventing that CCD took an afternoon. Uh, management came down. In those days, there were uh, people making magnetic bubble memories which were shifted a magnetic bubble around. And management came down and said, hey, we need something like that in a semiconductor. So George Smith and Bill Boyle, uh, he said it took about an afternoon. The problem was they made their CCD. And you have an interface here between silicon and silicon dioxide. And you have traps at that interface. And yes, they could shift electrons. But a large fraction of them got trapped. And he said it, the hard part, it took about a week to invent what's called a buried channel CCD that gets uh, sort of largely eliminates that problem. Uh, we're going to have surface channels. We can't do the equivalent of a buried channel. Uh, but it turns out we don't have traps. So that's where we, where we get, we win. So here is going to be, we'll see how the animation works. So we open the door, we bring the electrons in, we can sense them, we move them across the twiddle, we bring them across here, and so forth. We get sort of tired of this after a little while. And then you sort of let it just. So we're going to just clock these guys back and forth a lot of times. Um, now, if everything clocks perfectly, if there aren't any traps, Everybody comes back in one line like that. They all come back exactly on the gate they're supposed to. If you do this with a silicon CCD, you don't get that. You get something more like this, where some electrons get left behind either on that direction or that direction. So they're spread out over several pixels here. And so what we can now do is bring them in one line at a time and sense them. And what we found is that, in fact, the electrons were all still on the one they were supposed to be. And we can measure that after we do 10 pixels. That's over and well, 20, I guess, is over and back. But then you just go more and more. And so we went out to 10 to the 9. That turns out to take a dinner. And so that was as long as Forrest and Micro were willing to wait for it. Um, and in this case, we loaded about three electrons 
per channel. And then down here, we had on average a little less than one electron per channel. Remember, where these are averages over 120 channels. So some channels will be empty, some may have two electrons. End result though is you can go 10 to the 9 pixels, which yeah, was about 70 minutes, or in terms of distance, those electrons have been moved 9 kilometers. Uh, and we didn't lose any. So that's just telling you, yes, there are no traps on the surface of superfluid helium, which on one level you say, well, of course there aren't any traps on superfluid helium. However, when we got into this, we were very worried because people in the ion trap world who have conceptually a very similar thing where you have a CCD and you're moving things, you can run into problems with patch potentials on the gates. And here we don't seem to have any problem with that. Um, exactly why, I don't know. Um, it may just be as some of those patch potential issues are, are get better at low temperature and we have to be at low temperature. So we're stuck automatically at uh, you know, one and a half Kelvin. And maybe that's, maybe that's the answer. Chris is shaking his head as if maybe he agrees. How well are these measurements telling you that you don't have any traffic? You've got, you know, out of 20 things. Can you tell that you don't have even a single straggler? Uh, we can measure this. Um, realistically, we can measure about five electrons. So uh, if, if we had five stragglers, uh, we might see that, but we've repeated this many times and did not see, could not find any stragglers at all. So, um, yeah, if we the track, If there were stragglers, they would probably not all be in the same channel. So they wouldn't all be, yes. So, and so you can't see a single electron. So we cannot see a single electron. So there could be. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think if we, if we were to average it, I guess the thing I would say is that after 10, if, if we were seeing stragglers here, they'd be all over the place by 10 to the 9. So at 10 to the 9, there might be, we, we can't rule out the possibility that there may be some stragglers there, but I think we can rule out the possibility that there are any stragglers here because then we do it another two orders of magnitude and they would have gone all over the place. So, uh, yeah, so we can certainly say at the level of 10 to the 7, no stragglers. Uh. All right. So what can we do with this? Well, as a side thing, uh, something we are, we're trying to, to do, uh, Neil around here? Neil's not. Neil Zimmerman. Uh, he said, hey, why don't you guys try and make a new current standard? Uh, the idea being that uh, if we can have exactly one electron, now we don't at that point, but if we can put exactly one electron into each pixel, then we can have something that gives us one electron per clock cycle. Okay, so there are other, other systems, uh, superconducting turnstiles that will give you one electron per clock cycle, but here we think we can do this simultaneously over 120 parallel channels. And so the goal is we have good voltage measurement, Josephson effect, we have good resistance standard, quantum Hall effect. If we can get a current standard tied to fundamental constants like that, that produces maybe a thousand electrons for each clock cycle, then we think we could do this so-called metrological triangle. We could get a order of nanoamp and so that's something we're, we're trying to figure out whether we can do. So now we want to talk about detecting single electrons. Uh, and here is an example of somebody detecting single electrons. So this was actually done a while ago, uh, where they had a pool of helium here and a little five micron diameter ring over here. Uh, this was Yuri Makarsky's lab, uh, though actually the first experiments were done jointly with Yuri and Mike Lee. Uh, Yuri is at Saclay and and Mike, he's retired now, but he was in uh, Royal Holloway. And what you do is at the bottom of that, you put a single electron transistor, and they are seeing steps as you bring in more and more electrons. So what we want to do now, for a couple reasons, one, because we want to try and make our current standard, 
We want to try and do something where we get a single electron per, per channel and have a lot of channels. So what that means is we need the equivalent of a whole bunch of these. We need a bunch of cattle shoots where you have, or in this case, sheep shoots, where you bring a bunch in and then we want to repeat that a thousand times and you get one at a time coming through. So uh, this chip, uh, it turns out it's a little smaller than the, than the Sandia process. So this was made through this Moses. Uh, actually, it was made by IBM, but, uh, but yeah, it's just a standard uh, foundry process. Uh, in fact, what we, again, all we care about are the metal layers. Actually, here we did build some, some electronics underneath just to play with to see how it worked at helium temperature. Uh, what we had to do is the top three layers of metal, it has, I guess, eight layers of metal. We had to etch those off because uh, they don't have the high enough resolution. And then we get down to this layer. Uh, and you can see we're going to neck down our, our channel just like you do with sheep. And electrons repel one another pretty much like sheep do. Um, uh, maybe a little. Uh, and uh, so the, the useful number is that at a distance of a micron, uh, the energy is about 16 Kelvin to bring two electrons to within a micron of one another. Uh, the dielectric constant here is all one. So, uh, so you need to be of order micron fraction of a micron if you're trying to sort these things and get one at a time uh, with a temperature of one and a half Kelvin. Uh, and what there are, we have, we'd redesign things. So again, there are all these gates going, in this case, sort of vertically. There's sense regions over here, and we can clock these guys around. Uh, this is actually what the chip looks like uh, after it's sort of bonded up into a package. It's two by two millimeters. And the way it's all put together, um, so here, this is the body of the cell. This is the top of the cell. This, it's not obvious, but there are two layers here. And you'll, this is going to come back to haunt us. You see there's this uh, copper tape around there. I, I convinced Micah that what we wanted to do was have a socket in there that we could put our chip in. Now, this, um, this chip carrier, though, it doesn't have pins out the bottom. And so there's this plastic socket sort of sticking up above it. And if I talked to Chris, he would have told me that's a really bad idea because it means I have insulators that are exposed to my electrons. And the first time and second time and third time, Micah tried to put down electrons, no electrons in the chip. The problem is the stupid socket charged up. And so you don't get any electrons. So Micah had to go around and cover it all with copper tape. And that has introduced you have some strange fields up there. And so our electrons don't load particularly uniformly on this chip. And that comes back to haunt us. Uh, and here is the zinc piece that there's a fiber coming down. And so all that assembles together. Uh, and so this is a picture. What we are going to have, we have a reservoir over here. And it has this funny shape uh, for the same reason it has all these holes. It turns out in the semiconductor process, we don't have any control over it. They put a whole bunch of holes in the metal layer because I think probably to control stress so things don't, don't sort of uh, buckle. Uh, and what we had to do is keep these channels narrow enough. Otherwise, they put blobs of copper in the middle of our channels. The first chip had all kinds of blobs of copper. So we had to make it narrow but collect electrons. Uh, we had to get a special dispensation to, to have large areas there. The lucky thing was is that the boss had done her PhD around the corner from me. So I knew Carolyn, and so she hooked me up with the right people to get special dispensation. What we're going to do is this one we're going to use just for storing electrons. This one we're going to use for sensing, for measuring. Actually, we could sense there, too. Uh, there's a twiddle gate, and this is the sense gate. Uh, yeah. And then here's our turnstile, and this is what we'll call a narrow CCD and a blow up of the turnstile. It has five little gates. The center one is it's narrow. So now 
You'll see we're going to start out with all these electrons over here. The door is going to let a packet of electrons in. And now we're going to clock that packet along. And as this narrows down, they don't all make it through. And then we take the excess and put them back here. So we have somewhere 10 to 20 electrons in that packet. And now what we're going to do is bring those on into this sense region. And we're going to make the three middle gates positive, the outer ones negative. And now we are going to slowly make this one more negative. And we're going to split that packet into two. We're going to throw a bunch of electrons away, measure them, take them back, and store them. And then we're going to repeat that. Now we have half as many. And you keep doing this, and you measure them, store them, and so forth. So now at some point, you're going to end up, hopefully, with one electron. And the question is, which way is that electron going to go? Is it going to go off to the right, and then we'll go measure it? Or is it going to go off to the left, and we want to control that? And so what we're going to do is put a little voltage on this side, a little delta V. And at some minimum delta V, we can force that electron always to go under gate 4, or above gate 4, I guess. Uh, if we put on too large a delta V, then if we had two electrons, we want one to go to the left and one to go to the right. And instead, they'll both go to the left. So that sets a window. And so as a function of delta V, we expect to see a little ledge. And uh, this is what Micah saw, I should say. So these are 78 parallel channels. So we're not measuring one. We're doing on 78 parallel channels. And these are three different days. It's, so this is just a little pump helium system. And so it's not like a dilution refrigerator where you keep things cold for weeks. Here you keep things cold for about eight hours. And so Micah had gotten this. Now it turns out. Um, I was out of the country. This was on the weekend. Micah was headed off for a honeymoon on Wednesday of that week. And so she was getting all this data. Uh, and she had not yet calibrated the sensitivity of the amplifier. So you can go in and you have to make a measurement of the capacitance, which you, you can do by looking at a frequency dependence. And so she saw this nice ledge and said, aha, we've seen the ledge. Um, well, when you calibrate it, you find out that was between 78 and 156 electrons and with 78 channels. So she is looking at the two electron ledge, uh, this plateau. And now the question is, why aren't they all exactly at two? And that goes back to this problem with the, uh, with the charging and the copper tape in that independently she'd done some measurements where using the vertical channels, we can take the electrons in and then clock them and see which channels are the electrons in. And uh, in these, this particular arrangement, uh, you cannot, they tend to all be in the middle. And depending how many times you flash your, your little UV source, you fill more or fewer. And so we're pretty sure what's going on here is just, in this case, only filled about two-thirds up here, uh, we had nearly all the channels filled. And again, uh, that just depends on, on how, how many times we flash. At the time, when, when Mike had done these experiments, we didn't realize that was an issue. So well, that's something uh, a new student is going back and getting sorted out. So let me just say the last thing is, OK, we can move these things around. We're pretty sure, well, if it turns out there's something fundamental about a two electron plateau and we don't get a one electron plateau, then we forget all about quantum computing because it's going to be a whole lot more interesting to look at why there are two electrons. I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, but now you say, how are we going to measure? How are we going to do things like a, a two qubit gate? And coming from a semiconductor background, the obvious answer is make a quantum dot and put the electrons in there and turn on an exchange interaction. So if you want to measure spins, the easiest, well, conceptually, the easiest is look at the singlet triplet splitting in a quantum dot. Now, things are a little different than in 
say, a hunk of gallium arsenide or a hunk of silicon because our electrons are real electrons. They have a mass of one. Uh, in silicon, they have an effective mass of about 0.2. In gallium arsenide, they have an effective mass of about 0.07, which means that their wave functions, as the mass gets smaller, the wave functions get bigger and fluffier. So that just says that the radius of a dot has to be smaller for electrons on helium, which has to be smaller than for gallium arsenide. And people have found that out, that yeah, gallium arsenide, you could use sort of half micron dots, micronish. Uh, silicon, you have to go down about a factor of three. What we've shown is calculations that if you have 0.08 microns, so a little under a tenth of a, of a micron, uh, and here are the voltages you put, which are, we think, reasonable voltages for this system. Uh, you can get a splitting between the singlet and the triplet of about two and a half Kelvin, which if you're working in a dilution refrigerator, makes it easy to sort by energy those two. And now you say, well, that sounds pretty small. Well, then you go over and you look, uh, 22 nanometer SRAM, uh, modern one. Well, that is actually now people are smaller than that. Uh, if you look at this, there are four lines here. These are all the, this is an SRAM single bit cell, but that's about 500 angstroms across. So, uh, so an 800 angstrom, yes, 500 angstroms across. An 800 angstrom uh, dot isn't too difficult to, to build. So let me conclude then. Um, I guess one of the conclusions is, yeah, these electrons on helium, they're a fun system. You can study a lot of fun physics, two-dimensional electron physics, hydrodynamics. You can, uh, people take superfluid helium-3 and decorate it with electrons to, to understand the helium-3. But also, you can make what look like <coughs> devices. So we can make CCDs. Uh, we can make these turnstiles. Uh, the other thing is we've sort of like atoms and, and trapped ions, we've moved the electrons out of the material. So we have a trap-free interface, really small spin-orbit interactions. We don't know how small yet, but uh, we put limits on it. And uh, that ESR line I showed you, as far as I know, that's the narrowest electron spin resonance line anybody's ever measured. And it's really that those guys worked really hard at getting their magnetic field uniform. And so, uh, so yeah, we think we can make mobile qubits. It's basically silicon technology in terms of length scales. It's all just the same as, as standard silicon technology. And maybe we can make ourselves a turnstile. So thanks very much. <laughs>